okay, we're studying First and Second Timothy this morning. There we go. It's a little behind like me this morning. <laughs> All right. So this is this is taking a little while for me to get used to here. Uh, and I haven't had one of these on in a while. Understand what you're going through, Gil. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so uh, the first letter of Timothy, uh, as we as we take a look at the background here a little bit. Of course, Paul was writing this. this uh, from uh, when he was in uh, when he was in Rome, and uh, Timothy was down in Ephesus at the time, at around uh, 63 to 65 A.D. And as we look at uh, the di- something's going on here with the uh, this this is not that and that is not. Okay. the uh, the main the main slide is not changing so this one here <clears throat> it's just staying where it is <laughs> okay no fair playing games on me this morning <laughs> ah beautiful thank you sir Okay, so the geography, let's get the, get the geography uh, right here. But, um, I'm sorry, when, when I uh, said before that Paul was up in Rome, Rome was, Rome was where uh, Paul, of course, spent his first imprisonment. And so uh, all of these activities we're talking about now are, are, are post-Paul uh, getting, getting released from his first. And we, uh, we, we showed you... Uh, in our last lesson where he was on his way down to Nicopolis, which is down on the, right, right, over, right, that, right there in Macedonia. So this letter to Timothy, written between somewhere between 63 and 65 A.D., uh, of course, this is a very busy period uh, for not only Paul, but for the Roman Empire, because the Emperor Nero is in charge. N- Nero the Nut... Uh, Nero, the the guy that fiddled while Rome burned, that that guy, and uh, and so there's a lot going on. Uh, Timothy has uh, Paul asked Timothy to stay down in Ephesus, and we all are familiar with Ephesus. It's a well-established congregation. Paul spent three years there, and so uh, Paul's uh, asked Timothy to stay down there. And so Paul's somewhere in Macedonia, and he's writing this this letter down there. Uh, this was written, as we say, we talk about Paul's fourth uh, journey, missionary journey. We don't, we don't think about that very often, but between the time that where he went to, uh, came out of prison the first time, he, remember he was wanting to go to Spain, he was going to go to a lot of, he was promising people he was going to come by and visit them again. So we, we think of this as Paul's fourth missionary journey, and we don't have a lot of details on it other than the fact of uh, the um, the letters which we are studying have have the information uh, in them to get an idea of kind of where Paul was, and so uh, I just can't breathe. I'm sorry. I just can't breathe. I'm getting ready to pass out. Uh, uh, you all stay where you are. I, I will try to uh, not have to speak as loud now, and hopefully I won't spray y'all. <clears throat> okay. Uh, yeah, written uh, while Paul was on his, uh, in between, uh, he, was, he was heading through Macedonia, and so uh, we find for, in 1 Timothy 1 and verse 3, we, we see where Paul is talking about the idea of leaving Timothy down there in Ephesus. For the next two letters, that's basically where Timothy uh, is, is at, at that point. And he, so uh, Timothy's spending a lot of time down in that area. A well-established church, we understand that. A lot of uh, personal contacts with, uh, between Paul and the Ephesians. And Timothy 
is a very, very close associate. Now, we, we, Timothy goes all the way back to uh, when on the second journey, when Paul was going through Lystra, and he met Timothy there, uh, and we know all of the, the great, we, we've had quite a, a, a few lessons here uh, recently associated with Timothy and his family, the bringing up from his grandmother and his mother and all those teachings and stuff. So Timothy's known Paul for about 15 years, so this is a long relationship. And so this letter, the first letter, is a very strong exhortation to him. Uh, he's uh, going to be instructing him uh, and encouraging the brethren at the same time. The intent for this, these letters, of course, is to, they're, they're personal in the way of instruction to Timothy, but they have uh, far-reaching impact on all preachers everywhere as, and Christians in general. So uh, we'll, we'll see in the second letter that uh, that, that principle comes out. In the, in the second letter, Paul now has been... Uh, imprisoned for the second time, and he's now coming up on his execution. And so, um, because Nero di- uh, went out of, went out of office, uh, lo- died in 68 A.D., uh, we know that this had to have happened prior to that because Paul was executed under the reign of Nero. And so, somewhere in 66 to 67. And again, uh, now this is from, from Rome down to uh, Ephesus. Uh, Second Timothy is, there's no way around that. I mean, we, you thought we saw some personal letter with Philemon, for instance. Very personal letter. Second Timothy is a very, very personal letter. Uh, you know, the, you think about the letter that you write to the person that you love prior to you, on the eve of your death, I mean, that's the situation that Paul's in here, and he knows he's not going to see him this side of heaven, and so there's some things he needs to, needs to say to him, and he does very well in this, this second letter. And it was uh, one of the, probably the strongest and most heartfelt books that, that you'll ever want to read in the Bible, and uh, I hope you had a chance to, to go through it maybe once, maybe a couple times this week as you looked at it, and keep that in mind. Uh, he talked about the concern, you could feel the concern that he had for the churches that were going to be going through this persecution, one that he's experiencing and he has experienced, but also the, you, could, you can just, it just oozes with the disappointment that you can feel for those that had been faithful who had fallen away. And uh, that's, that's something that's very critical to, um, to that particular letter. So it's a very strong exhortation to remain faithful, knowing that he's not going to be around much afterwards. Uh, We can't go any farther without saying at least a couple of words about some of these false uh, teachings that are going on, um, especially Gnosticism and asceticism. Uh, We've already talked about the Judaizers, okay, so that is a... That's always a third, but we're more, we're more familiar with them. You take the old law, you try to apply it to the new law. That's the, what the Judaizers were trying to do. But uh, much more insidious was, the, uh, was what was going on with those that believed in uh, Gnosticism and asceticism. First of all, Gnosticism, and this is not all you'll want to read on this. Uh, there's a lot, a lot more. This is just the, the tip of the iceberg to give you a feel for some of the things that are written, that Paul's writing about in here, and you go, oh, why is he talking about that? I haven't heard that one before. Okay, well, that's because these teachings are starting to come into the church. And uh, Gnosticism, uh, it comes from the word gnosis, the Greek word, uh, means just knowledge or to know. And in essence, the, the, the main point is that you have matter, which is evil, all evil, and spirit, which is all good, and those two don't mix at all. And and so you take man's body, for instance, this is matter, okay? That means that man is all evil. And the spirit, God's spirit, then every spirit, anything of spirit is all good, and, and the, the two don't mix. Uh, another idea was the idea of salvation. You, you can only get salvation by releasing the, 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 that which is good 
the spirit from your body, okay? And as a result, and, and for instance, um, some of the false doctrines that come out of this, for instance, are, uh, well, to be able to do that, you have to have special secret knowledge, okay? Now, Paul, a lot of these things you'll... you'll uh, remember are from different things that different words and phrases have come up from different uh, teachings that Paul has made. We've, we've heard the term mystery before, for instance. You've heard all the, these different things. When you take uh, valid principles and you pervert them, this is, the, this is the kind of stuff that you come up with. The Catholics, for instance, took this to uh, you know, a whole nother length. This is where you get the idea, for instance, that the clergy can only understand the gospel. How did the Latin language remain the main language in the worship services for you know 1,500 years? You know, uh, because nobody else could understand it anyway. You know, and so it was only the learned clergy and those that received the Spirit, whatever. You know, all of these things came out of this this particular. Uh, area, and you're going to see this in First Corinthians, First and Second Timothy, Titus, Second Peter, First, Second, and Third John. The idea is associated with these kinds of things. These are the foundational principles of that. There are many other things that then bleed off of that, from sound doctrine to perversion, and all kinds of things that they, they get in get into that. Uh, this what we're dealing with here is not the very developed Gnosticism that is going to just destroy large portions of the church in the second century on. Uh, as a matter of fact, this will become mainstream for the universal church, the Catholic church. This will become mainstream, which was the mainstream in, in the future. So it's not something to be just sneezed away. Uh, it's, this is serious stuff. Asceticism is the idea of severe self-discipline, uh, avoiding overindulgences. And where this comes out in the idea of, for instance, uh, uh, Catholic priests, Buddhist monks, you can't, uh, you can't marry, you, you have to uh, go into a monastery. And again, you can see where... Combinations of this, like we ran into in Colossians, uh, combinations of Gnosticism and asceticism pulled together, and you get you know people you know in mon monks and monasteries beating themselves you know bloody for with with you know to get rid of the of the evil body and and you know try to re reach a higher level of consciousness and all all of that. So all of these things are, are tied up in this. So. We will, you will notice these things that will come out in certain part, parts of these, these two letters and, like I said, these other ones. So that's all you're going to get on it. That's all we have time for. Um, but if you want to read about it, there is a lot of historical information available on, on this. And uh, if you've had any uh, background with denominational teaching at all or have ever run into it, you will find it just rife with all of this, this stuff embedded in there. So, good, good information to know. Uh, okay, so let's look at 1 Timothy. Uh, the first question here was to name three reasons for Paul's first letter to Timothy. And I gave you some verses to look at uh, to kind of guide you towards what I was looking for, but there's always many ways of looking at these things. So, what are, give me one of the reasons uh, that, with that first one, in verse, verses 3, verses 18, Give me one of the reasons that uh, Paul was writing this letter. Go ahead, Charlie. Okay, so would you call that like the, the general charge that Paul's given to Timothy? As a, as a preacher, is, is, that, is that not job one? Preach this and only this. Leave yourself and everybody else's opinions, uh, you know, somewhere else. And this is, this is what, it, and so, yeah, so that's one of the reasons that Paul was right. Because Timothy's by himself down there, right? And other people come through by time to, from time to time, but let's face it, he's, he's down there working on his own. Okay, so what's the second one in these, that uh, second group of verses that I gave you? What's the main major topic in there and reason that, that Paul's writing this letter? 
significant issue that he was concerned about? The coming of apostasy. Okay, the coming apostasy. Apostasy meaning what? Uh, falling away from what? To and re, by what? Uh, false doctrines. False doctrines. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Todd. That's a whole sermon right there. Uh, false teaching, false doctrine, false teachers, all of that. Every, everything is false. Okay, so uh, what's the third one? Uh, like third group of verses there. Paul needed to give the preacher something here to guide those elders which he's appointed. So what, what does he need? Clarissa, I say your head going, gang, 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 gang. Okay. Okay, so he's dealing with the, uh, the idea of first the appointment of elders, and then um, the elders are to watch the flock, right? And make sure that, that uh, in worship services, everything that we're doing is in accordance with the word. That, that's why they're, they're, they're in that position. So, yeah, so we have instructions on worship, and, and all of that is, is in there. So, very good. All right. Now, let's go on to question two. What false doctrines were infiltrating the church at Ephesus when, where Timothy was located? So let's, let's look at this. Uh, we, we talked a little bit about it. What, what one is, is mentioned in verses 3 through 7? Okay, we got the Judaism part in there. And uh, what, what part would, would tell you that it was about Judaism? You said the old law, teaching teachers of the law, verse 7. Is that what you're talking about, Linda? Okay, very good. Yeah, they, it leaves clues here, so that's why I wanted to give you some of these definitions up front. So what's, what's the other one that uh, is mentioned here? Verse 4, I'll go, go ahead, Jeff. Uh, okay, so it's talking about... You know, fear Mary, abstinence from God created, things like that. Okay, okay, very good. Um, yeah, especially in the uh, ch- chapter 4 part. Chapter 4, it, 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 talking about forbidding marriage, abstaining from foods, all that. Uh, in, in the, er, the uh, verse 4, it talks about myths. Talks about myths in uh, in verse four. What would that uh, lead itself to that we talked about? Mm-hmm. Special knowledge. Uh, okay, yeah, it, uh, that's tending in the things associated with the, this idea of the Gnostics, that's right? So, okay, very good. So, we, it basically he's going to touch on all three of these in this this particular letter in those in those areas. All right, question three. Oh, oh. oh, yeah, go ahead, Jeff. One, yeah, you, you see the source of this, right? The same, it talks about you know, paying attention to the deceitful spirits and the teaching of demons. You know, so he's instructing elsewhere that we need to be ready to battle these principalities and powers within these things. And it's interesting here that he identifies the source of where these where these teachings are coming from. Yeah, what was the source? Satan. Or he said demons, but you know, Okay, look at verse two. But the Spirit explicitly says all this, blah 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 blah. By means of the hypocrisy of liars, seared in their own conscience, as with a branding iron, men who forbid marriage and everything. Does that mean there were a bunch of demons running around? In there? There's a bunch of people claiming that there were demons running around. You got anything different than that today in, in uh, churches across the United States in different places? You ever heard that, that kind of thing before? Come out! of You know, I mean, you've, you've seen it on TV if you've ever been up late at night <laughs> or whatever. Yeah, so this, uh, we're not only talking about uh, I mean, basically, it's, it's two things. It's the doctrine 
but it's also the people who are spouting the doctrine. And the, and we, and the preachers are, are getting instructions and, and Christians in general now, you got to go out, you got to refute these folks. You refute them zealously and strongly. And uh, you're going to, as a result of that, you may encounter what? Persecution. That's right. Persecution. So something to, something to think about there. Okay, question three. Thanks for that comment, Jeff, on that. Um, in 1 Timothy 3.15, Paul said that he wrote to Timothy so that, quote, you will know how to conduct yourself, one ought to conduct themselves in the household of God. Similar to Titus 2, what instructions did Paul give Timothy in chapters 2 through 5 to carry out his command to various groups of Christians? Now, I gave you a lot of leeway on this one. Uh, all right, let's, let's go ahead and just, just uh, let's get one from this side and one from the middle and one from uh, you guys over here. <laughs> let's start over on this side. Give me just one instruction that uh, Paul's going to give to Timothy in those three chapters to carry out this command of you will know how one ought to conduct themselves in the church. Give me one over here. Sam? Um, so there's a specific example. Give me the verse 2. Uh, in chapter 5, verse 1, not to sharply rebuke an older man. Okay, go ahead and read that. Uh, do not sharply rebuke an older man, but rather appeal to him as a father, the younger men as brothers. Okay, great. So helpful instructions, again, very specific now uh, on how to deal with people they're going to run into in these situations, okay? All right, let's get one from the center here. Who wants to give me one? Lena? In chapter 2, he mentioned several times how people need to stay constantly in prayer. Uh, Okay. I desire, therefore, that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting, uh, chapter 2, uh, verse 8. Okay, I good. thought about it a lot, especially this weekend, because of the war going on and how, you know, you sometimes think uh, one side of people prays for the victory and one side of people prays for their victory, mm -hmm. but then it says here, without wrath and doubting, uh, which removes one side from there for sure. Yes, it does. It's very anyway, good. chapter 2 says a lot about staying constantly in prayer. Those, those first uh, eight verses of chapter 2, yeah, are uh, significant uh, things about things that we... Would that have an impact on uh, what they do in worship services? Sure, we do it here, right? Men that, that get up and, and pray from time to time, they'll pray for their the leaders, and it's always, a, a thank you, man, it's always for the, for the idea of that they would be, they would do as God wills. I mean, you can pray for anybody to do that. I mean, that really, that really is, no matter where, where they come from, what the background is, you never know when a heart will change if given the right, uh, the right thing. Gil, did you have a comment? <laughs> I'm now appreciating the, the looking at the eyes, you know, instead of, <laughs> okay. So uh, over here, give me one over here. Shirley? Uh, one God, one mediator between God and man. Okay, what verse? Ooh, I didn't put down the verse. <laughs> Chapter 2, verse 5. Okay, so the idea of the oneness, you're talking about the unity here, okay. Anybody, give me something on uh, how you, conduct, how you ought to behave yourself. You ought to behave yourself over here, this side. All right, give me, give me one thing. <laughs> give me, uh, with a verse. Anybody over here? Go ahead, Tim. What's that? Exercise yourself toward godliness. Okay, what verse is that? Chapter 4, verse 7. 4, verse 7. Could you read that for me, Tim? Detect profane and old wives' fables and exercise yourself toward godliness. Okay, okay. Good, good uh, advice on anything. So there, there's all kinds of things in there. That, that uh, you can see why this is a, a preacher guide. Oh, go ahead, Robert. 
it's not a specific verse, but almost all of chapter 3 talks about overseers and deacons. And those are not exclusive to overseers and deacons. Those are just qualities that good Christians, not even just, obviously, husband of one wife cannot be a woman, but right. the overall tone of what's being said of sober-minded, not quick to wrath, those are all things that we should all look to have in our daily walk. Yeah, and that's, that, that's the way we look at Preachers, good preachers, and we got one here, uh, they, always, they always take it back to you and me, right? where it's important and and so it, you know that's that's what when you give a list of topics things preachers ought to preach on preachers don't preach to themselves well they do but uh, but their, their their job is to be getting the word out to us and we're the ones that are supposed to be getting the message so when you, you give a preacher list of things to talk about you know that list is for you and me and so uh, yeah very good uh, question four. In 1 Timothy 4, Paul instructs Timothy on the methods of dealing with false teachers. So give me, give me an example of, uh, give me an example of what the false teaching is, and then give me what the remedy is, and give me the verse that you're looking at. <laughs> That's all in that question, whether you knew it or not, but it's, all right, Jeff? Well, the one we were just talking about a minute ago, and then verse Especially the foods in verse four and five that you know, they forbid foods, but in verse four, for everything created by God is good and nothing should be rejected and received with thanksgiving if it's sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Good, good. So you have the problem, false teaching, asceticism, abstaining from uh, this is what the false teaching is, and, and then boom, here's here's the solution for that. And uh, so we've got other ones that are like that. We've got worldly fables in verses uh, 7 and 8. We've got people who try to look down on your, your youth. What do you do with those, Timothy? Uh, you got the special knowledge stuff. Um, for instance, uh, Todd, would you read 1 Timothy 4, verse 14? Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was bestowed on you through prophetic utterance with the laying on of hands of, by the presbytery. There is, there is a very specific explanation of how the spiritual gifts are to be given, and for us, how they were, how they were given, basically, in, in there. So if you have, ever have a, a, a question about, somebody comes up to you and says, oh, yeah, I got the Holy Spirit, you know, came upon me, now I can, you know, do Here's, here's, here's a reference right here that you can refute that false teaching and use this along with the other examples that are given to be able to refute the false teaching. Okay, so God's taking care of us to take care of his word. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Tim. Uh, see you, Timothy. It's a compliment. <laughs> Todd. <laughs> uh, it's interesting how the tone, I think, in the first letter is very matter-of-fact. These things are coming be prepared, uh, point these things out to the brethren, right? Just point them out, mm -hmm. be a good example. And then when you get to Second Timothy, like we will in a minute, it's the, the attitude is much more urgent, right? You need to be ready in season, out of season. Don't be afraid, don't <coughs> be, be ready for, uh, he's already in the thick of the fight. Yeah. Where here it's, you know, just basically here's the preacher's job description. Yeah, yeah. very good. That, Keep that in mind as we get into Second Timothy, because there is a great tone change there, and urgency is the biggest is the biggest change with that. Okay, let's go on to uh, uh, oh, Jason. To that that question, there is the fact that he tells them that you point these things out, and so uh, you mentioned about having a good a good preacher, a good evangelist. A uh, good evangelist is going to recognize something that is opposed to the word and is going to point those things out. They're not going to gloss over those things. They're not going to let things continue to, to develop within a congregation. They're going to point out the things that are not according to sound doctrine, which is what Paul is telling Timothy. This is this is the way that you have to be. And we likewise have to be the same way. That we, when we see those things, we point them out. And when we see those people, we point them out. Yeah, good. Yeah. And uh, and that's not comfortable. It's not something that's going to be comfortable to do, but it's necessary. And, and it's if we love that person, what are we going to do? 
We love them. What are we going to do? Because if they keep teaching false doctrine, what's going to happen to them? They're going to be lost. They're lost right now. If they're teaching false doctrine, they're lost right now. And, and so, I mean, yeah, it's, there's a sense of urgency that should be associated with them. Or we're hypocrites, aren't we? If, we? if we say we love them and then don't by our actions, we're hypocrites. That's, that's the def- definition of it. All right, so question five. In uh, 1 Timothy 6.2, Paul commands Timothy to teach and preach these principles. Uh, list the principles from chapter 6 that Timothy was to preach and teach. Give me one. What, what was, a, what was a, a principle here in chapter 6? Well, say that a little louder. Bond servants to their masters. Bond servants to their masters. What, what is the principle, though, that they're to teach about the bond servants and the master? Did they have slaves and masters in the congregation? Or at least a possibility in the future that could, if there's not now. So what's the instruction? Charlie's got the subject. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's kind of different, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's usually going to be a bad situation, but obey the master, that, that is, and, and Why? What's the why associated with that? Verse, verse 1, chapter 6. There's got to be a reason. Why, I mean, why do it? Because you won't get beat as bad? I missed the last part. Yeah, okay, so the, so the God won't be blasphemed, basically. So the doctrine, what they're teaching, what teaching them to do won't be blasphemed because they're going to have good influences because some, something's wrong with the Christian slaves because they're not acting like they did before. And they're acting a whole bunch different than the folks that aren't Christians. As a matter of fact, I really like these Christian slaves, the way they're acting. I wish everybody would act like that. As opposed to, man, these Christian slaves, man, we got to get rid of these Christians. Somebody write your congressman, you know. We got to get rid of the Christians because they're terrible. You know, they just, so yeah, this, this would be important for them. Okay, and then we have uh, godliness linked with contentment. We have the rich should invest in good works with the true value. Um, guard the doctrine, uh, verses 20 and 21 of chapter 6. Uh, very, very Im- important for the preacher. Guard the doctrine and avoid avoid stuff that takes up your time is, and it's just useless, valueless arguments about nothing. Lena? Well, also servants, it also tells about the masters. If masters are the believers, just like in Philemon, they uh, have to be respectful and treat the, uh, the servants as brothers, not as their slaves. Right. So we have both, we have both sides. And and hopefully, you know, with, with that one, you've got the slaves within the slave quarters. You talk about a gossip center, right? When the slaves get done working at the end of the day, you know, you think they talk about their master ever, you know, get in there. And all of a sudden, how would, how would that be helpful to the master to have a good reputation amongst the slaves for fairness and kindness and all of that? Would that, would that be helpful? Yeah, practically speaking, that would be very helpful. But it also makes it so that if the, that, that master is being the Christian that he could, he's got a ready audience there to preach the gospel to, doesn't he? <laughs> uh, you talk about a captive audience. That's a, that's a captive audience. But he's going to teach as much by his, his, what he's doing as he is by what he's saying. And, and so uh, that applies, folks, to all of us at work, at school, whether you're a student or teacher, you know, the employer, the employee, I mean, it just applies everywhere uh, for, for things that we need to do. All right. Second Timothy, turn the page. Question six. All right. Paul had three reasons for writing to Timothy. I gave you some clues as to the verses you could go to to 
uh, see what I was thinking about. But uh, most of all, this being a very personal letter to Timothy, how did Paul feel about Timothy? Look to him as a son. Had he been with Timothy for a while? He'd, he'd been over a period of time with Timothy for a while. How long had he been separated from Timothy? Well, we don't know exactly, but we know that Paul's about to be separated for a while from Timothy. However long from Paul's death, <laughs> and if Timothy was faithful till Timothy's death, I mean, because because Paul's going to die soon, right? So he he misses Timothy. You can you can tell it's just obvious. Twice in verses nine and twenty one of chapter four, he's urging him, "Join me as soon as possible. Get here." He's going to die. He doesn't know when, but he's it's going to be soon. So that's one of the things. And what what was the the, the second set of verses? What was that concerned with? Paul had a great concern for especially since he was going to be leaving soon. Just a personal letter to Timothy, right? No application to any of us for anything. Keep teaching without fear. Okay, yeah, exactly. He, this persecution is coming. And, and so what would be the normal human thing to do in face of people that are coming in to kill you? What would be the normal human thing to do? Hide, run, certainly stop teaching the stuff that's going to, you're not going to be out there teaching people. They might just turn you in. But, that's, but that is not what, uh, what Paul is telling Timothy to do in here. And so, yeah. He's, to, he's telling them to guard the gospel, chapter 1, verse 14, persevere in the persecution uh, in the, in the uh, persecution of the gospel, uh, chapter 3, verse 14, preach the gospel, chapter 4, verse 2, and if necessary, suffer for the gospel, chapter 1, verse 8, chapter 2, verse 3. So uh, basically stay strong in, in face of this persecution. The, the uh, third one was, I thought was kind of clever. As we think of 2 Timothy as a very personal letter to Timothy, and he's given them some, some very urgent instructions in here, but yeah, there's, there's indication here that he, there is a great desire for Paul, uh, for Timothy to actually take this to the Ephesian church where he is and just to share that with them also. And uh, I never noticed it before, but the, um, when you, the you, if you look at chapter 4, verse 22, of First uh, Timothy, the Lord be with your spirit, grace be with you. The your there in the beginning of that is is a singular. So the your is Timothy. That he's talking to the you is plural in the second in the second sentence, which is an indication that we would say y'all. You're and y'all. That's what the you, the you is in there. So there's an indication that you have that, that uh, Timothy is supposed to share this, not only with the Ephesian church, but you've got the other churches in the area there. So, Okay, so question seven. What part does suffering play in the work of an evangelist and anyone who teaches the word of God? What instruction does Paul provide Timothy in the first and second chapters of 2 Timothy that will be of great comfort to anyone doing this important work. So this, this is a long list that could be in here. I, I'd like to just read a couple of scriptures here. Uh, chapter 1, verse 7, somebody over here. First hand up, we'll get it. Chapter 1, verse 7, Sam. Okay. And Yeah, go ahead, Sam. Yeah. Oh, the, the your is uh, singular. So in talking, he's talking to, you know he's talking to Timothy because the, the Lord, talking to Timothy, the, the Lord be with your spirit, Timothy. 
No. And, but the last verse is, grace be with you. And that's the plural that's there. So when, it's, like I said, it's y'all. You, you can't say y'all to one person. I learned that coming from the north. That's, that is greatly wrong. <laughs> so it's you, Jeb, and y'all out there in the audience. Okay, so that's, that's what he's saying. He's saying, you, Timothy, and grace be to you out there. The larger, uh, you know, it's a larger plural thing. Good question. All right. So who wants to read chapter, uh, so the, the, the verse that, that Sam re, uh, read there, basically remember who you are, rekindle the fire within you. That's, that's the, the, the thing that's, that's, going, that's trying to be brought forward there. Uh, who wants to read chapter 2, verses 23 through 26? Chapter 2, go ahead, Robert. Nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with great, with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. Okay, so... Great. Again, you see how to build and maintain godly characteristics, uh, you know, within the congregation and stuff. So there's a long list there of all kinds of things. I came up with hmm, about 10, 10 different things there in general uh, that are there, and there's, there's many more. Okay, so uh, question eight. Paul paints a bleak picture at the beginning of chapter three, uh, yeah, of 2 Timothy. What actions does he direct Timothy to take in chapters three and four? that will enable Timothy to fulfill his ministry. His ministry. Ministry. Um, give me one. Give me one thing and, and include the scripture with it. Paul, uh, <laughs> Paul the elder. <laughs> Ray. Uh, chapter 3 and chapter 4. Uh, where, give, me, give me one of these actions that he's directing Timothy to take that will enable him to fulfill the ministry that he's been given. Which verse is this? Chapter 3, verse 4. Okay. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God. Okay. What, what, what's, what's the action that's supposed to be taken against those people? Well, those are, that's bad. Those are bad. So what's, what's, give, me a, give me an instruction that, that will help Timothy against these kinds of folks. Lena? Ah, very good. Okay, very good. Gee, do that to the folks that Ray was talking about <laughs> right there. That's right. So there's uh, the many other things there. Uh, again, uh, if, you, if you haven't had a chance to read it again, I would go, go back and look at 2 Timothy again also. So. All right, next week is James versus, uh, we're, we're switching books now too. This is the new book, uh, How Long, O Lord. So y'all should have the new book. Y'all should have the new book. <laughs> versus, pages 18 to 26.